creativity can be a strange and mysterious process. How does the intangible of inspiration become something tangible? Noted sculptor Alan LeQuire is known for turning a lump of clay into giant and sometimes controversial accomplishments. He is an artist who appreciates the human body, but takes us on a journey in which he shares the workings of his mind. This particular woman is very athletic and uh, she's a very strong, muscular person. And I want to try to convey that without it being uh, too masculine looking. When I look at her, I see these sculptures, primarily 19th century. Uh, figures of sort of a classical heroine, a Nike or a goddess of victory. And it sort of goes with who she is. It's going to be interesting to try to make it a portrait of her specifically and not refer to specific sculptures from the past. When you make something in clay or stone or wood and it suddenly seems to wake up and come alive. That's the mystery. It's sort of a trick, it's like a magic trick, but it has a deeper side to it, which is animating an inanimate material. It's the whole act of creation. And that, to me, is the inspiration for everything I do. As creator, as magician. The art of the artist is to take something simple and transform it into something different. Something more. Something extraordinary. For renowned Nashville artist Alan LaQuire, he was the material which his parents helped shape into an extraordinary sculptor. My mother was an artist and a teacher, and she exposed me to a lot of uh, sculpture when I was a kid. And my dad was a physician, but he taught anatomy in the medical school at Vanderbilt. And I was allowed at night to uh, participate in and draw dissections, human dissections, along with medical students. So he helped me early on with anatomy. When I was about 11 years old, he uh, brought home a human skeleton it was all in pieces in a, in a box and uh, helped me reassemble it and I kept that for years. From such a unique introduction to the human form, creative passion has evolved. Now Alan puts flesh of clay on those bones, but clothing is optional allowing both artists and audience to appreciate nature's art. The human body is an endless source of inspiration. It's the one subject that everyone responds to, one way or the other. I feel connected to the entire history of art making in our culture when I use the human figure as a subject. Clay is, is wonderful to work with. I mean, you either respond to it or you don't, but you know, when I was a kid, I was out making mud pies and playing in the creek or whatever, and it's like that. It's the ultimate sculptor's medium. You're not limited to the size of the block. It's, it's additive as well as, as subtractive. It's complete freedom. Any texture, any, any quality uh, that you can imagine in three dimensions can be created in clay. I enjoy the, the physical part of it, the actual manipulation of the material. And that moment where the inanimate becomes animate. Looking for that, manipulating that experience, 
uh, as you manipulate the material. That's the real excitement for me. My technique is all based on this concept of uh, positive form. There are no negative forms anywhere. There are only places where positive forms meet that create shadows or that create a, a crevice. You take these small pieces of clay, you roll them on with the soft tissue of your thumb, which makes the, each individual piece of clay swell. And when all the forms and all the pieces of clay are swelling, then it's like the intasis of the columns of the Parthenon. They seem to be alive because there's a presence inside them forcing them to swell outward. And that's what makes a portrait come to life is when it's got that feeling of its um, a presence within it. I think the impulse to create sculpture is really an impulse to fight the progression of time. I don't have any desire to freeze a moment in time, but I have uh, the desire, especially with creating human figures and portraits, to stop the process of dying, of aging, and preserve a person or a moment in time because it's where my heart is that, at that moment. To preserve a moment in time, the Greek goddess Athena granted Alan that opportunity on a scale he could scarcely imagine. In 1982, Alan was awarded a commission to sculpt and install an accurate statue of Athena in Nashville's replica of the Parthenon. It would become an amazing challenge for the young artist. I spent three months doing the initial research. I went to Italy and to Greece and consulted with different archaeologists. Then I began a series of small versions of the statue and sculpted the piece in clay. As I would finish each section, I would make molds in plaster. This process went on for years and each section took at least six months to sculpt and cast. But there were concerns over the support structure of what was on its way to becoming the Western world's largest indoor statue. So the Parthenon itself had to be remodeled. They knocked four big holes in the main floor and they poured these gigantic footers and then they poured four concrete columns that come up through the floor and above it, and then there's a concrete platform that connects the four columns. So the whole thing is like independent of the Parthenon and its floor. And the joke was that, you know, that we have an earthquake, the building falls down, but Athena's still standing there <laughs> on top of her pile of rubble. Athena Parthenos has an estimated weight of 12 tons. Its height is a towering 41 feet, 10 inches, leaving only about 12 inches of space between it and the Parthenon ceiling beams. By the time the statue was fully completed, Alan had spent a span of 20 years on the project. Another large-scale work that had its own challenges, Alan's Musica sculpture, explodes from the earth in Nashville's Music Row district. For Alan as artist, it presented a totally unanticipated challenge, one that came not from the piece itself, but from some of the public. Your work is always sort of out there, and it's very gratifying when someone responds to the beauty of the work or understands what you were trying to do with the work. But it's sort of frightening when they react negatively, and Musica was an example of a piece that uh, I was totally bowled over by the negative reaction before the piece was unveiled. It's such a big piece, it took me two weeks to install. 
the pieces were veiled, so and no one had seen anything. I made sure of that, but it had been released to the public that these were nude statues. And so these people were driving by in their cars and yelling obscenities at me. The, these Christians were yelling obscenities, and I really felt threatened a couple of times where people I felt were, might just turn into this, the traffic circle and mow me down. And then after I unveiled the statue, I never heard an, another negative word. I heard a lot of congratulatory remarks and lots of thank yous, and the negative part of it just died away immediately. Art and artists inspire. An inspiration is a subtle form of teaching, of passing wisdom, experience, and technique along to other artists. In his open studio classes, Allen invites artists who want to sculpt, paint, or draw. His mission is to pass along his gifts, just as his parents and mentors did. I enjoy teaching. It was very unpopular in the 70s and 80s to, to do the figure, to study anatomy and proportion, uh, to learn how to paint in a traditional way. A lot of the skills that I sought out were not being taught. So I, I felt it was sort of my mission to keep that tradition alive by teaching. The skill of creating works in three dimensions is no different than drawing. And this is what I teach my students. The key is to move around the piece, or have the piece move as I'm doing here. Um, you can view a piece of sculpture as just a series of contours that are put together. In France, they called it looking off the edge. You try to look for contour and you move. So you, you look at a change in contour. If you move around enough, you'll um, wind up with a three-dimensional object. For student Jonathan Stone, who expresses himself through canvas instead of clay, Alan's lessons bring both challenge and change. Well, I've learned a lot about the figure, looking at the sculpture that he does and the way he interprets the figure. He, he does interpret it in a very dramatic and expressive way, and I like to try to do that sort of thing myself, so that's kind of inspiring to me. I've never really felt that it was about me. The work was always just about the work. The work, from the massive and overwhelming to life-size, to smaller-scale images of our humanity. For Alan LaGuire, the drive to create is not about the artist, but is about the art. That's sort of a great thing about art making. It's not really so much about your personality, it's about the work itself. I create the art so that I don't have to leave an image of myself anywhere. It's, it's just about the work. It's like a smoke screen, but um, hopefully the work itself has a larger meaning and importance. Sculpture, like any other creative endeavor, it's a constant striving for perfection. Whether or not that's possible, I'm not sure. For example, I'll create a small figure study that I think is great, incredible. The manipulation of the clay is, is uh, it's just as it should be. And then someone else will look at it and say, but yeah, but she's not smiling. Why, you know, they don't. Other people don't see what I see in the material. I mean, a perfect piece of sculpture would create that response in everyone. Uh, everyone would see what I see and, and appreciate it. So 
I'll probably never get there. <laughs> I keep trying. Alan's art is among the most prominent in Nashville. His gallery showcases the works of other impressive artists as well.